Okay, there are three things I am merry about this morning. One, yesterday my wife Catherine made one of my favorite dishes that she makes, white bean chili. It was amazing, so I'm merry about that. And if you'd like the recipe, we won't even charge you. So ask her and get the recipe to you. Second thing, uh, second thing I am merry about. I am merry that 2020 is almost done. Amen? It's almost done. It's going to be behind us. Don't have to think about everything that went on this year. It's almost done. Third thing I'm merry about, I was blessed by that song. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, uh, Melissa, for that song. I was moved. And I wrote down some of the, li- some of the lines from the verse and chorus So many wait for the light of day, searching for truth who will show them the way, as those who heed the Savior's call will show his love and bring light to all. In a world where there's darkness, in a world with night, we can offer his peace, we can lead with his light. Sharing all that is good as we teach as Christ would, we can light the world. Could it be that God would use us to be a light in the darkness that we are facing here in our world? It reminds me of our mission statement. You know it. It's in bulletin. It's also on the front page of our website. Know, grow, and go. Know Jesus as our friend and savior. Grow a caring community. Three, go. Share the everlasting gospel. We want to shine light in the dark world. This is our mission, to shine hope, to shine the light of Christ. But I think to myself and I wonder, could it be that we struggle with shining our light because we have darkness in our lives? Could it be that we don't understand the substance of our mission? In other words, we want to learn this morning, what can we learn that will fuel our fire to share the gospel? so that the light of Christ can shine in our hearts completely so that we can share unhindered. We could share completely. So we're going to learn an important lesson this morning from a group of people whom you would least expect to learn a lesson from. And they were known as the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group of proud leaders in the days of Jesus. They did not want to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus, we're going to read about it here in John chapter 9, he performed this jaw-dropping miracle, but they still ignore him. And you will be surprised this morning to learn how similar we are to these puffed-up Pharisees. So how can we make sure that we are not hard-headed like these Pharisees. That's what we want to find out this morning. Let's pray. Father, please teach us how we can avoid having the hard-heartedness of these Pharisees and give us soft hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you this morning to turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, our main chapter for this morning's teaching. And we're going to start right in verse 1. We'll put it on the screen for you. John chapter 9 with verse 1. As he passed by, this he is Jesus. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, when you read this passage, uh, you might think to yourself, oh, Jesus is just taking a casual stroll through town. But if you don't read the passage beforehand, you will miss how drastic and how important this verse is. You see, Jesus got into a heated argument with the Pharisees. And in the passage before, we learned why the Pharisees were upset at him. I'm going to read it for you. And this is found in the uh, four verses before chapter 9. 
John chapter 8, verses 56 through 59. Let me read it for you. Please pay attention. Jesus is speaking here. He says to the Jews, these Pharisees, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And then he said this line in verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus talking about here? There was a man by the name of Moses. You learn about this in the Old Testament, whom God raised up to deliver his people, God's people, from the Egyptians. And Moses was wondering, all right, God, you're asking me to deliver, the, to deliver your people, but they don't even know me. They, don't, they hardly know me. What am I going to tell them? And God told Moses to tell his people, tell them that I am who I am sent you. Tell them that the God who exists, I am me, that I sent you. And so what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here in John chapter 8, he's saying, before Abraham was, I am. I existed. I am God. <laughs> who, are, who is he to say that he is God? And so the Jews in verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. And then we come to this verse. And as he passed by, as he was running for his life, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. He had compassion on him. While Jesus is fleeing for his life, he stops to help a troubled man, which struck me as I was studying this passage this week, even in the face of death, Jesus still thinks about helping people. Verse two now, here we go, it's on the screen. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Keep going here. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Next verse. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. One of the names of Jesus. I am the light of the world. He is the light. He is the lighthouse that shines light on the dark seas of our lives. He is the sun that shines his rays upon this dark world. But is there another meaning when Jesus said, I am the light of the world? Well, we get a clue when we go to John chapter 1, the first chapter of the same gospel. John chapter 1. Notice what John says about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. Who was the Word? The Word was Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he's God. He was in the beginning with God. Next slide. All things were made through whom? Come on, some of us just think, we think to ourselves, creation story back in Genesis chapter 1, God the Father speaks. Let there be light, and there is light. But according to this verse, Jesus was busy. Jesus was creating this world. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And check this out, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was what? And the life was the light of men. What is John saying here? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John is saying this. Christ is the light, and he gives life. In other words, 
Light and life are the same thing. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's actually pointing back to creation and reminding us that he was the one who created this world, that he is the creator, that he is the one who gives life. He is the life giver. I, had, I, have, I have read this passage before many times, and I have never caught the connection to creation. And just to prove to you that this is not just a crazy idea or interpretation that Nestor is coming up with, check out verse 6. We'll put it on the screen here. Speaking about Jesus, having said these things, he, what did he do? He spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Oh, come on, Jesus. Why, why spit? First question. But why even talk about the ground? Why did you have to spit on the ground? Well, let's go back to the creation story in Genesis. I'm going to read this for you in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Please listen. See, God created all the whole world, and then he, he, saved, he saved his crowning act of creation was mankind. And notice what the Bible says about how he created mankind. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. So Jesus, in creation, he forms man with the dust of the ground. And so what is Jesus communicating to this blind man? He's saying this. Just as I use dust to form you, I will use dust, I will use the ground to reform you and heal you, blind man. I will restore you to your original form. I will restore and heal you. And so he forms the clay. He collects the clay in his hands and he gently places it on the man's eyes. So what happens next? Verse seven. Follow along here, it's on the screen. Jesus said to the blind man, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing all his life. The blind man never knew what it was like to see. Now, I'd like you to put yourself in the blind man's sandals. For several decades, you had never seen the charming colors of a rainbow, nor the bright orange rays of a sunset. For your whole life, you had never seen the beaming stars of a clear night sky, nor the brilliance of the peacock. Your eyes have never glimpsed the tender glance of two young lovers, nor the sunny joy of your parents' smile when you took your first steps. Your eyes had never seen your reflection. You don't know who you really are. But now you feel the warmth of the clay on your eyes, and you hear with eager hope, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And you think to yourself, could this be true? Could it be that I might be able to see again? And so you carefully walk to the water. You slowly kneel at the edge of the pool. You cup the cool water in your tired hands and you bring the water to your face. The miry clay falls from your face and all of a sudden you begin to see shapes. All of a sudden you see the ripples of the water. All of a sudden you see the pillowy clouds and the bright sky for the very first time. You see the blazing sun with its smile so bright and you see the soaring birds tumbling in the air and the very first facial expression that you see is the look of amazement on people's faces to see that you can actually see. And you look back and you see the satisfied smile of your healer. His name is Jesus, the creator, the life giver, the one who restores people. It was Christ who restored the blind man to what he was originally created to be, a man with working eyes. Jesus heals people. The majority of us never have experienced physical blindness. Maybe there are some who are here, or maybe there are some of you who've experienced this watching online. 
But the majority, of, the majority of us have no idea what this feels like. But there are some here who are experiencing spiritual blindness this morning. And what we're going to find out in this passage is how to overcome this spiritual blindness. We're going to find out how we can be healed. Jesus performed all of these miracles to prove one point. In fact, John, the, John who wrote the Gospel of John, had one purpose in writing the Gospel of John, and the purpose was this, to prove that Jesus was the divine Son of God. Jesus performed all of these miracles to provide evidence of his divinity, but despite all of the evidence, there are people who still reject Jesus. Despite the whole world singing about the Christ child who has come, there are many, hundreds, thousands of people who still don't believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God. Why is that the case? We will find that answer in the next scene. So the blind man, he's healed. All of the neighbors and all of those who had seen him blind, they bring him to the Pharisees. Now these Pharisees, like I said, they were, they were hard-hearted. Hard-headed and hard-hearted. They were the religious leaders and scholars of their day. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the Bible, the Old Testament, like the back of their hands. But these Pharisees were quite rigid. They were stiff as a nail. They had some traditions that went a little too far. Notice in verse 16, John chapter 9, verse, 15, verse 16. We'll put it on the screen. They're talking to this blind man. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. Why in the world would the Pharisees say that Jesus is a sinner? You know why? Because according to their rules, Jesus violated the Sabbath commandment. You see, Jesus healed this blind man on the Sabbath. And what the Pharisees did, now follow along here, what the Pharisees did was that they created laws on top of God's law that they elevated as high as God's law. These Pharisees came up with traditions in addition to God's law and elevated that as high as God's law and told everyone, you better be following these traditions and these rules. Let me give you an example. One day Jesus was walking through the field with his disciples, and they were hungry, so they picked grain while they were walking through the field. And these Jewish Pharisees were upset. Why are you doing that, breaking the commandment? You know you're not supposed to be picking grain. Jesus is like, what? How did Jesus break the Sabbath commandment when he healed this blind man? How in the world did that happen? It's because of this. The Pharisees came up with a tradition that said if someone wanted to be anointed on Sabbath, you could only anoint someone normally as done on other days. Any special or unusual anointing, like spitting into the ground and making clay, any special or unusual anointing was forbidden, so Jesus, according to them, broke the law by anointing this blind man's eyes and working extra hard on the Sabbath. Please listen. The Pharisees created additional laws on top of God's law that served as a barrier to believe in Jesus. The Pharisees created additional laws that served as a barrier. What word did I say? A barrier to believe in Jesus. They had a mental barrier that hindered them from believing that Jesus was the divine Son of God. And just in case you think you and I are immune to this, I'd like to give you some news. We too have mental barriers. Maybe there's someone here watching online or here in this sanctuary, you consider yourself a non-believer. Maybe you're an atheist, someone who is definitely convinced that God doesn't exist, 
Maybe you're an agnostic, someone who is not sure if there is a God, but are someone o- somewhat open to the possibility of God. Or maybe you're a non-Christian, a Muslim, Buddhist, Jew, or Hindu. Or maybe you've grown up in a Christian faith tradition, but you are having serious doubts about God, and you consider yourself a non-believer. I just don't believe in Christianity. Some of you here have mental barriers that prevent you from actually embracing Christianity. And let me list some of the greatest barriers that non-believers share are reasons why they doubt and do not accept Christianity. Here are a few of them. You know what the number one is? Number one reason? The number one barrier is, how could a good God allow horrendous evil and suffering? How is that possible? How could a good God who has control, has complete sovereignty and control over this world allow a pandemic to take all of these hundreds of thousands of lives throughout the world? Here's another barrier. Truth is absolutely relative and personal. Thus, Christianity is so exclusive, intolerant, and culturally obsolete. Here's another barrier. The Bible that Christians talk about is a mythical fairy tale. Now us believers, we take this for granted. We, we come here every week to worship and we assume that what we hold in our hands is inspired. And they're coming to us and they're saying, okay, well, that's great, but I don't really believe that. It's no different from a legend or the most popular fairy tale, most po- popular fiction, fiction book at Barnes and Noble. And here's a very prevalent barrier in our society today ever since the Enlightenment several hundred years ago. Science, reason, has disproven Christianity and revealed that miracles are impossible. Forget all that supernatural talk. Science now is the arbiter of truth and explains, is the means by which to explain all, all uh, reality. These are, some mental, these are some serious mental barriers and some serious questions that you have with Christianity. And obviously, we don't have time to address these barriers. I have a, a, a group that meets at least monthly where we, 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 I call it God Talk Sessions, where we have conversations about belief and the possibility and plausibility of belief. You're welcome to join my monthly group on Zoom. Just email me, my email's in the, the bulletin. We don't have time to address all these questions, but I want to acknowledge that some of you, like the Pharisees in our story, have serious doubts, mental barriers, that prevent you from believing in Jesus Christ. But just in case you think I'm singling you out, non-believers, just in case you think that, you're wrong. You might be surprised to know that believers, too, have mental barriers. The majority of people here who are listening and watching to this teaching have been longtime Christians, Christians for a very long time. And unlike the Pharisees, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe that he is divine. You believe, and you come here every week to worship, and you believe that the Bible is fully inspired. You believe in miracles. You believe in the Christmas story. You believe that it actually happened. You believe that Jesus came as a baby, born of a virgin. But there are some of you who have mental barriers that prevent you from really believing and trusting in Jesus. What are some of those barriers? Here's one. This God whom I believe in isn't answering my prayers. I'm struggling with a disease. I've been praying, Nestor, all week for the past year, and I'm still sick. Or my relationship is falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. And I'm praying my heart out. And nothing's happening. Here's another barrier. If God loves me, why am I suffering the way I'm suffering? You know, in our community of faith, we lost someone special to us last week. Her name was Pat. She was a bright light for Christ. If there are family members here or watching, I want to share with you that our hearts break with your hearts, your hearts. She was a special woman, a bright light for Jesus. And some think, why would God allow a bright light like Pat to pass away? You know, just this week, just this week, I received two text messages from two people. One woman said, my mom just died. 
One young man said, an old friend from Chicago, he said, pray for me. This is Thursday night. Christmas Eve, pray for me. My little brother, probably in his mid to late 20s, he just died. And some people think, some believers think, why would God allow this? There are some who are hanging on to, to, to faith. You are barely hanging on. You have some real doubts. You have some mental barriers. You feel like the, the Pharisees did. And you are this close. You are this close to throwing out your faith. Believers struggle with mental barriers. Non-believers struggle with mental barriers. The Pharisees struggled with mental barriers, but underneath our mental barriers lies a deeper barrier. When you go home and read the rest of John chapter 9 in verses 13 through 34, you will learn how hard-headed and hard-hearted these Pharisees were. The neighbors of this blind man bring the blind man to the Pharisees, and so they start pummeling him with questions. They speak to this healed man, and they ask him, hey, 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 how did you receive your sight? I mean, this man put clay on my eyes, I wash, and I see. Come on. Seriously, how? It didn't matter how much they sh he shared, they still did not believe that Jesus performed the miracle. And so they said, okay, what we're going to do is let's go, let's go talk to his parents. So they went to mom and dad, and they said, mom, dad, is this really your son? And it, was he really born blind? And how was he able to see? And they, they say to the Pharisees, look, we don't know how he was healed, but look at him. He is seeing. And this is truly our son. But despite their testimony, the Pharisees still don't believe that Jesus is divine. They don't believe that he's the son of God. And then they go back to the blind man. They said, come on, tell us, how were you healed? He said, what is wrong with you guys? Seriously, listen. I don't know a lot of things, but one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. And it did not matter how much evidence this blind man gave them. The Pharisees, did not believe that Jesus was the divine son of God. Why is that? Because beneath their mental barrier was another barrier. They had a heart barrier. The Pharisees did not just come up with intellectual excuses. They had stubborn hearts. Despite all the evidence that Jesus gives them, the Pharisees don't want to believe that Jesus is God, period. I don't want to believe he's divine. Their mental barriers are just an excuse for their heart barrier. They do not want to give up their view of truth for this alternative view of truth. Their mental doubts are rooted in the stubbornness of their hearts. Their minds make an excuse because their heart does not want to choose. And so they have a heart problem. And to my non-believing friends, you might have some serious mental barriers about Christianity. And I understand that you need reasonable answers to your questions. I affirm you in your search for certainty. Listen, I would not buy a car if I didn't do my research, two Thanksgivings ago, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, 2019, uh, my car was hit from the rear. It's a foggy day, icy, and uh, our car was totaled. So I spent all this time researching, and you know, Catherine's probably wondering, why is he spending all this time researching and, and making sure, uh, you know, doing all this research? Well, I just want to make sure that when I buy a car that it's a good car, that when I buy a Honda, that it's a good Honda, right? Praise the Lord for Hondas. You want to do your research, so I affirm you in that. But I want us, I want you to be honest with yourself. We need to be honest with ourselves. Could it be that beneath the mental barrier, there might be this heart barrier that perhaps 
there's part of your heart that doesn't want to receive Christianity? And to my believing friends, do you think it's possible that the reason you have mental barriers is because deep in your heart, you want things done your way? For example, we pray and ask, we ask God, please let your will be done in my life. Whatever your will is, I am willing. But yet, we really want his will to be done on our terms and on our time. Let me give you an example. God, please, I want this disease to be completely gone, completely gone, totally gone from my body by next Friday. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for doing it. Could it be that we have doubts about God because we expect God to do God on our terms? Could it be that we have mental barriers because our hearts really want things to be done our way? And friends, I struggle with this myself. I've been experiencing a mental barrier because I've been wanting God to answer my prayers in my way, on my terms, and in his time. And what God is teaching me is be patient, be content, just trust me. I am stubborn. Come on, you know what stubbornness is like, those of you who are parents? And some of you who are grandparents are saying, yeah, been there, done that, good luck. But hey, 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 Nestor, before you point the finger at your own children, point at yourself. And when I look at the mirror, when I look in the mirror, I realize that I, too, am stubborn, just like the Pharisees. So stop pointing the finger, Nestor, at the Pharisees. You, too, are stubborn. And being stubborn is dangerous. You know, like most older post-surgery patients, the kind-hearted farmer was warned that he had to do his breathing exercises and tests to avoid pneumonia. He took the nurse's advice nicely, thanked her for it, and then proceeded to ignore it. After all, he had been farming all his life and he had done it his way. No one told him what to do and even if they tried, he was always the final authority. That was the state of mind behind this, behind this warm, friendly exterior. He came through the surgery all right, didn't he? So why was some silly huffing and puffing needed now? But even as his lungs began to fill up with fluid, he remained unconcerned. His family begged him to reconsider. Come on, please, reconsider. Take the nurse's advice. But he refused. And as the nurse curtly said, it led to his demise. Could it be that our stubbornness might be leading to our spiritual demise? Could it be that our stubbornness might be putting us in the dangerous position of rejecting Jesus as a divine son of God? I believe so. We're stubborn. So how do we overcome this stubbornness and start to believe in Jesus? Well, I thank God that the clue is in John 9. John 9, verse 35, I'll put it on the screen. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I, believe, I may believe in him? Next slide. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And look what the blind man said. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. This healed man, healed man had no problem believing and worshiping in Jesus. Why is that? Because of verse 15. I'll put this on the screen. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. The blind man believed in Jesus because he was healed. It's as simple as that. The Pharisees were blinded by their stubbornness, but the blind man, he begged for help. It was the softness and the tenderness of our, his heart that made all the difference. So, how do you and I overcome our hard-heartedness? Let Jesus put clay on your eyes. Let him put mud on your eyes. How do we overcome our stubborn, stubbornness? Let him heal you. And I do want to say this word to some of you who have serious barriers. Jesus does not ask us to remove every single doubt and barrier before we start believing in him. 
He offers his healing in the midst of our doubts. He says, come as you are. Just have an open, a tender, uh, malleable heart. And I will help you to start believing in me. How do we overcome this stubbornness? Not by our own strength. We cannot heal ourselves. We just let Jesus put his mud on our eyes and heal us. You know, this Christ demonstrates the beauty of what Christianity is all about. Do you know, what, you know why Christianity is beautiful? Because it does not, because Christianity, uh, the beauty of Christianity does not lie in our efforts to heal ourselves. Rather, the beauty of Christianity lies in the reality that Jesus expends all his energy to find and heal us. How do I know that? Look at John chapter 9, verse 1. Put it on the screen here. And he passed by, Jesus passed by, and he saw a man blind from birth. He could have ran away because they were, they were stoning him, right? They, were, they wanted to stone him, but he stopped. He had compassion on this man. And after he had this debate with the Pharisees, notice verse 35, and we just read this. Pull it on the screen. Jesus heard that they had cast this, this healed man out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Christianity, the core of Christianity is not man trying to heal themselves. Rather, the heart of Christianity is that there is a Christ who is on the hunt, finding us, running after us, because he wants to heal us. And so it's not so much us trying to heal ourselves, but simply slowing down and letting the divine healer, Jesus Christ, catch up to us so that he can put his mud in our eyes and heal us from our blindness. Amen. It's this Christ, it's this Christ who expends all his energy to help us out. You know, in one sense, Jesus was the blind man. Jesus was the one who became blind for us. Jesus was God, and he was with God the Father and God the Spirit from, from, Pat, from all of eternity, for all of eternity. And Jesus, at some point, decided to come to this earth as a little child to take upon himself the blind and sinful nature of humanity. He only lived here for about 33 years. And at the end of his life, before he was going to die, he cried out to God in a garden. He said, God, I don't want to die. God, please, I don't want to die. But despite his fear, Jesus decided to go through his crucifixion Jesus died on that cross, and he was blinded by death. They laid him in a tomb. He was blinded by the sleep of death, but he received his sight, and he was resurrected from the blindness of death. His sight was restored. He ascended to heaven. He saw the Father. He saw all of the angels singing, glory be to this God. Glory be to the Christ child who died and was resurrected and purchased the salvation of every man and woman in the entire planet. And it is this Christ whose sight was restored who wants to restore, restore your sight and my sight today. And the question is, will we be like the Pharisees and continue to be so hard-hearted to blind ourselves from the reality of Christ? Or will we have an open heart and allow ourselves to slow down and allow the gentle he healer to come alongside of us to put his mud on our faces? That's the question. And so my hope and prayer is that you would allow him to heal you. As the praise team comes forward to sing our closing anthem, our closing commitment song. Maybe you've been touched by the teaching from God's word, and you're sensing in your heart, I would like, to, I would like my eyes to be restored. I'd like new sight today. I want to invite you to speak with me, speak with some of the pastors here, we even have a connect number. 
It's in the bulletin. It's on the screen here, 970-279-4342. We hear often from people who respond to teachings on Saturday mornings. And perhaps you're saying, I want to begin this journey with this healer, Jesus, because I want my eyes open. I want to learn more about him. Why don't you text that number? Let us know. Maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe you have a comment. We'd love to hear from you. But I do want to say this, that there's nothing like allowing God to heal us from our blindness. There's nothing like getting our eyes back. And when, when God gives us these spiritual eyes to see, we have much joy. We have something to be merry about. So let's stand together and let's sing about this joy, this merriness. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. It's this Christ who heals us. says in John 9 verse 15 then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight he said to them he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see father place your mud on our eyes that we might wash and that we might see Jesus in his name we pray amen mm -hmm.